Our next speaker, when I read through his profile, when we read articles about him in the newspaper, it does make us all feel proud. Again, reinforcing that if we start focusing on the po positives, we can do wonders. An alumnus of IIT Madras, degree holder in aerospace engineering, and masters in management. He is currently the executive vice chairman of the Hinduja Group, the vice chairman of Ashok Leyland. Significantly, he is also part of the scientific advisory committee, committee to the cabinet. He is also the group advisory for the GMR Group, India's largest, one of India's largest infrastructure groups. And in his earlier avatar was the chief executive with Tata Motors, the car business. With that, I invite Sri Sumantran to address us all. Hear me? Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. I'm going to start with uh, some form of an apology. I was laid down with a viral fever after I came back from Europe about a week ago. So I have, uh, this is the first day I'm out again. And if while I'm speaking to you, I break into a cough, forgive me, uh, I probably will not be as. Uh, active as I normally am, but I certainly didn't want to miss an opportunity to be here with PMI and all of you today. <laughs> I did have an occasion to speak at a PMI conference, uh, I think it must have been about a year ago. Um, and uh, in, in that conference, uh, quite uh, predictably, we were talking about program management, uh, and again, re reflecting on my career in the auto industry, talking about the evolution of this whole structured, disciplined approach to program management uh, that, uh, in many ways, the auto industry across the globe has adopted. And uh, I had shared a number of uh, personal experiences and reflections from my own career. <coughs> and. Uh, not wanting to really go over uh, covered ground yet another time, I thought I might make a, a, a bit of a departure this time in terms of what theme I thought I might focus on uh, in this discussion with you today. To start with, uh, there is often the perception when one talks about program management that uh, the topic is linear. It is predictable. In fact, indeed, one of the objectives of program management is that you don't want unpredictability. And so that there is a linear execution of a series of actions, an orchestration of what you might say predictable activities. And uh, indeed, the manner of orchestration, the manner of efficient execution, indeed, is what uh, constitutes uh, successful program management, which by and large is true. However, we also find increasingly that the world is changing so fast that there is no longer any luxury of saying that I will do the predictable. Uh, economic conditions are different. Uh, business uh, and competitive uh, environments change far too rapidly. And so there is no longer the luxury of saying, I'm going to take aim at something, and I'm going to execute a series of disciplined tasks to get what I want done. Because where you've taken aim at will probably change during the course of the program. And as a result, today we have to challenge the topic of program management, not only with successful, careful execution, disciplined execution, but also to add to it the element of dynamicism and the element of innovation, because you're literally changing course as you plan what you want to do. 
And so this is a new dimension that is cropping into practically every regime. I know you had a wonderful talk from Mr. Sridharan, a person I greatly admire. And uh, he would be the first one to say that executing Delhi Metro is going to be very different from De executing Cochin Metro or any other metro. The, the circumstances are different. The, the geology is different. The business constraints are different. And so this is, as we would say with uh, any other uh, business sector as well, we're going to have to learn to do program management along with uh, an ability to deal with discontinuous disturbances. I also believe that when you do this, uh, there is inevitably the linking of what you would call the role of culture and the role of organizations. I think uh, we need to build into our organizations the right culture that therefore allows not only disciplined execution but also dynamic changes of course and the incorporation of innovation even as you're trying to do something that you want. And therefore, uh, in this talk, I would like to share a little bit of what I've seen as personal experiences uh, with this new flavor of definition of program management and the leading to what I hope is uh, an India advantage. I mean, one of the truly exciting things about seeing so many people here is that the realization that all of you will be big contributors to program management in India. And as an optimist about the future of our country, and as an optimist who sees, notwithstanding all the gloom that we talk about, one who sees progress being made in so many different avenues, to realize that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, India can be and India must be considered a hotbed for program execution, program management, and to build upon the wonderful track record that we have built in the IT sector across a much broader spectrum of program management, that all of you will be able to contribute to India's reputation as an efficient, highly dynamic program management uh, ecosystem. And for this, we have to look at an, an India advantage. To me, one element of this India advantage, not just because of uh, the fact that we live in an economy that has constrained affordability, but one element of this advantage would be a cost advantage. Cost advantage is something world over everybody wants. BMW wants a cost advantage. Mercedes wants a cost advantage. Rolls-Royce is looking for a cost advantage. And so there is nothing cheap or nothing inexpensive about working towards a cost advantage. And as I would hopefully also share with you in my uh, brief set of experiences, that there is an opportunity for endowing programs and large tasks with this element of innovation and the orientation towards the cost advantage. And in my view, this is one set of foundations that will give India a huge head start in the next century. Let me start with some of my uh, notable milestones uh, in, in my experience of this kind of uh, program management and innovation. Very early in my career, I had a chance to work with this man. He's a very talented uh, inventor, uh, professor of Caltech in uh, California, uh, Paul McCready. Paul McCready was, uh, apart from a, being a notable scientist, he was also the world uh, record holder for sailplane flying. And uh, the time when I met him, he had just finished a very exciting project. This was the project. The project was to fly across the English Channel on human power. And so he designed this aircraft, which was called the Gossamer Albatross. Just before this, he had built the first aircraft that was human powered, capable of human powered flight, the Gossamer Condor. And in this aircraft, as you see, there is a bicyclist who is sitting in the gondola and he's pedaling and the pedals are connected to the propeller at the back and that's the only motive force for this aircraft. What's also impressive is that the aircraft has a wingspan of a Boeing 737. 
and uh, the aircraft weighed 33 kilograms. Uh, you can imagine going up to a Boeing 737 with two suitcases, and uh, the weight of the aircraft is the weight of the two suitcases. And so it was a remarkable uh, feat of achievement in terms of design, execution, pro and managing that whole program. And by the way, this was a successful flight. And I was talking to Paul about this because he and I were working on the next project together. So I was obviously in awe as an aerospace engineer. I said, this is a brilliant feat of engineering. I was commending him on what a remarkable achievement it was. Paul is a, was a karmajan, you know, a brusque uh, old guy. And he said, no, no, it was the, the project was over-engineered. So I said, what do you mean it was over-engineered? And he said, well, our mission uh, duty cycle for the aircraft was that it should be capable, it should be tough enough to take seven takeoffs and landings, that the structure must be capable of withstanding seven takeoffs and landings. But by the time they actually flew across the English Channel, it was the 11th takeoff. So obviously, the aircraft was over-engineered. Now, you begin to realize that when you are talking about very critical missions, truly, what he said was true. Maybe that could have been the difference between failure and success. And that the extra one kilogram that may have been added to have uh, inadvertently allowed the aircraft to be capable of 11 takeoffs and landings, not seven, could have been the difference between success and failure. But it also led one to believe that today, in so much of programs, we have what the Japanese would call muda. You know, one of the things we've all learned in manufacturing is from the Japanese to say, uh, Kaizen is all about eliminating waste, eliminating unnecessary movement, eliminating unnecessary action. And this is what the Japanese call muda. So if you go to a very efficient Japanese factory floor, you keep looking at how over generations with Kaizen activity after Kaizen activity, they've eliminated waste. And so they've eliminated wasted movement and muda. One asks the question, what is the equivalent of muda in design? What is the equivalent of muda in a program? How much waste is there in design or in program? Design engineers use the word factor of safety. You know, factor of safety is this uh, wrap all under which you just sweep in a whole bunch of things that you don't know or a bunch of inefficiency that you brush under the carpet. But truly, if you're challenged to say, I will exercise the same discipline towards muda elimination in design as one would do in a process, one can imagine completely new thinking. And indeed, it's that kind of thinking that leads to uh, this kind of a product and this kind of uh, an attitude. Now, this got me to remember that uh, when I started my career at uh, General Motors Research in, the, in, in Detroit, uh, this gentleman was the original founder of GM Research. His name is Boss Kettering. He was, uh, again, a famous inventor. He was the person who invented the electric starter for the automobile. And he always used to say, engineering is a combination of brains and materials. More the brains, less the materials. So I think uh, the idea, therefore, that we start to look at elimination of waste, elimination of unnecessary content, and to start to orient towards efficiency uh, was something that I began to connect and said, you know, this is a critical, important uh, uh, learning as we start to look at uh, larger programs. Now, <clears throat> why I believe all of this is important for us in India is, as I come back to my theme, I believe that in India, um, we are well placed to address cost efficiency in the world. Just as much as the Japanese have taught the world lean manufacturing as a result of their space efficiency concepts, after all, just in time and Kaizen and Kanban all came about because of space constraints in Japan. 
and their constant orientation towards being more efficient with use of space is what led the whole world to go to the altar of Japan and learn about lean manufacturing. In the same way, India is a place with constrained resources. And frankly, believe me, the whole world will soon be constrained of resources. We're using oil, we're using natural resources, we are using rare earth materials all faster than anybody can imagine. And the intrinsic virtue of efficiency and uh, frugality are going to be worldwide uh, virtues in extremely great demand. And for us in India, we have a natural advantage. We've grown up with learnings of frugality. And if we are able to translate this into a sustainable uh, global industry advantage, it would provide for us a huge uh, fillip as we build the industrial power of this nation. Now, what is innovation to a cost advantage? Of course, today you have a lot of books that talk about this. And some of them resort to what one may call jugad. You know, I would first say that while there is some element of Jugad, cost innovation is much more complex than Jugad. But let me just get into this for a bit. When I was at uh, Tata Motors, um, one of the projects we had to execute was to build a crash test laboratory, uh, the first crash test laboratory to be built in India. A crash test laboratory is one where uh, in a controlled area, controlled environment, you actually crash a car, and you crash it in a, in a zone where there is a lot of illumination, and you have the ability to have very high-speed um, images. And as a result, you literally uh, deconstruct the image, and you look at what happens when a car crashes, what happens to the occupants when a car crashes, what happens to the engine compartment and the structure of the car as the car crashes or in an effort to make the car safer, make the occupants survive very bad accidents. You've got a problem because uh, those light banks that you see there on the two um, upper sections, very, very expensive banks of very high illumination lighting. And they came back and they said that the banks of light, whether we buy it from GE Lighting or Siemens Osram, those light banks themselves cost 68% of the total appropriations. So there's no way we can afford to crash this laboratory. Well, probably in the normal course of events, that would have meant that you defer the program, you, you go back next year, try to get a little 20% more budget. But then there was one of the guys in the team who said, you know, my cousin works in the Bollywood studios. And uh, they use a lot of lighting out there, so let me have a go at it. And uh, actually, long story short, the crash test lab was commissioned with a bank of lights using the technology of Bollywood film studios. The cost of the light bank was 12% of the cost of the quotation from G Lighting. <laughs> More importantly, the project happened. And this is, to me, the Indian approach to frugality. That I have never, ever been disappointed in giving Indian engineers a task, put them in a box, define the boundaries, and say, you can't come out of that box. But demand a solution within that box. And nine times out of 10, you will not be disappointed. But I would submit that cost innovation is more than just Jugad. Uh, it would be unfair and perhaps uh, uncharitable to consign all of such thinking of cost innovation to something that we call just native Jugad. And let me explain. To start with, let me quote from this famous man, Ingvar Kamparad, the founder of IKEA. He says, to design a desk that may cost $1,000 is easy for a furniture designer. But to design a functional and good desk which shall cost $50 can only be done by the very best. 
this is this is the challenge of cost innovation cost innovation is not easy it takes the best minds to do cost innovation and that's why i say it's it's a lot more than jugad it uh, was brought home to me a little later in my career by this time i was heading the uh, engineering operations of uh, saab automobile in sweden which is also a part of general motors saab is a very safety oriented car company and uh, one of the uh, uh, objectives they had was by this time of course this was uh, early 2000 and by this time all cars had 14 airbags and uh, all the electronics you wanted and yet the people were interested in looking at what was called a whiplash injury protection system the way this happens is uh, when you're sitting in a car and let's say somebody behind you in the traffic light comes and hits you in the back your neck gets jerked back as a result of the impact and very often you suffer what's called a whiplash injury of your spine so the objective was to protect whiplash injury of the spine and to come up with uh, not just uh, the airbags around the car but also to have head restraints that would actively deploy to protect your head and uh, we worked with many suppliers and we worked with the usual range of technologies so some of them were looking at again miniature airbags that would pop out some of them were looking at very fast servo motors that would actuate as you see in this picture where the head restraint actually is accelerated forward at the time of the impact to catch your head, catch your neck and while all this was going on there was one woman swedish engineer now the swedes by the way are extremely uh, uh pragmatic engineers they are brilliant very simple uh, typical of their culture they're not very flashy but they like simple things at work but this is why scandinavian design is noted for simplicity at a great elegance so she was looking at this and saying you know this is all nuts you know how many more sensors and how many more pyrotechnics and what do we do to this and she said if i look at the biomechanics of injury when your back gets hit the first thing that happens is your lower back presses against the seat so if i were to use the energy of that and just have a simple lever system i would be able to move the head restraint without having to have complicated electronics pyrotechnics sensors and so on and the fact is that this is what ultimately ended up as the saab advanced head restraint system it was patented and today most western european products use this patent in terms of the simplest most efficient way of providing this and the beauty of this was no electronics no pyrotechnics no extra sensors just a simple mechanical lever and a very good application of the principles of biomechanics and physics so this was not the easy solution today today we have in engineering a tendency to reach for another set of sensors and another set of actuators because it's so easy to do so but just intelligent application of science and engineering can lead to simpler more efficient and more robust solutions uh, and at the end of the day these are a lot more cost efficient this is also true for larger systems i'm also a keen pilot so i keep following what goes on and there is right now just as much as we've talked about the nano the tata nano there is a similar revolution going on in aerospace there is a new generation of what's called vljs very light jets these are revolutionizing small aircraft design and uh, manufacture and as you can see here there are two generations of cessna aircraft the one on the left cost 7 million dollars the one on the right cost 2 and a half million dollars the one on the right was introduced 2 years ago it's all composite it has a much more advanced electronic fadec power system it's a very advanced cockpit electronic and flight control systems with an advanced man machine interface has similar performance and costs one third the price and this has also been achieved because of from the ground up 
engineers have rethought the whole problem of what is a business jet? What are the flight control systems? What are the cockpit installation systems? What is the structure of the aircraft? And a complete change in the way one has defined the aircraft resulting in a much more affordable cost and today these are now becoming aircraft accessible by private pilots who in the past wouldn't uh, try to buy a business jet for their own personal flying. Of course, uh, during the time that we developed the Nano, uh, it was an extremely exciting program. I, I didn't stay till it was into production, but uh, had enough uh, enjoyment with the team during the design and development phase of this program. And there were a number of innovations in this. Uh, here again, it, is, it goes well beyond Jugad. To give you an example, the body in white structure for this uh, nano, uh, the, the, the full vehicle, by the way, weighs 623 kilograms. That's about 170 kilograms less than a Suzuki Alto. And Suzuki is a very efficient, low cost, low weight manufacturer. And the fact that this car has 35% more interior space than a Suzuki Alto and weighs 180 kilograms less meant that there was a tremendous amount of engineering and design in the structure of the vehicle. To give you one example, there was a structure that tied across the two B pillars. The B pillars are the two central pillars of the car. Just by having that additional structural member, one was able to take out a huge amount of weight out of the traditional B pillar and the roof structure. And that this was executed by design in such a way that it didn't affect the ergonomics of the usage and still achieved a huge amount of weight reduction was one example of how right from the configuration, the choice of the engines, the choice of the engine layout, the choice of the suspension, huge amount of effort was taken to make sure that we would achieve a new cost point uh, that has hitherto not been achieved. Now, we all know that uh, subsequent to its launch, it has not fared quite as well as uh, everyone had hoped. But um, I think uh, the fact that not only this product, but uh, the whole system behind this product has had so much uh, follow-up uh, leaves one to believe that uh, we were truly on to a good thing. And to give you an example, uh, a couple of years later, I met this gentleman at the Geneva Motor Show. Uh, for those of you who follow Formula One and perhaps those of you who are over 40, he would be known as uh, Gordon Murray. Gordon Murray was a very highly decorated, highly recognized Formula One designer. He designed the car that you see there, which won the world championship with uh, Brabham. Gordon Murray met me in Geneva right after this whole nano uh, story. And he said, you know, I've spent all my career so far working in Formula One where we were looking at shaving 10 grams of weight every time uh, and improving the product and improving the design by literally shaving 10 grams of weight at a time. He said, I never realized how exciting it must be to work on a project where you're shaving 10 cents of cost at a time. And uh, to put his money where his mouth is, this is the project that he has now jumped onto. So God Murray has dropped Formula One, and he's on to a crusade of trying to develop an efficient, low-cost car. And a low-cost car, as you see shown here, admitted by Gordon Murray to have been inspired by the kind of thinking that went on for the Tata Nano. As you can see, this is unpainted by design. It's a composite vehicle with a clamshell door construction with very different, he didn't, he was not copying the Nano, but he was being inspired by the Nano to rethink how you design a car at a completely new cost point and at a completely new investment point for the manufacturing process. So there's been uh, a fair amount of, uh, should we say, credibility afforded to the nano in, in the way the thinking that uh, it implied. 
And today, uh, this is my own set of photographs from the last Frankfurt Auto Show. When you go to the Frankfurt Auto Show, now you begin to see products like this. Uh, the bottom one is an Audi. The one on the top right is a Volkswagen. And one on the top left is an Opel. People are now beginning to think of smaller, lighter, more personal automobiles that will have a lower CO2 footprint, that will have less space on the road, and therefore signaling an interest in a new kind of car, not just the traditional kinds of cars that we've been used to. Uh, I'll just conclude a little bit with some of our own group activities and what we're doing. We've tried to take this theme further in many areas. One was uh, we found that uh, as we go to the future, the, so the level of society's concern for the environment is going to increase phenomenally. And uh, we're seeing truly tremendous headway being made uh, not just for the products that we have here in India, but when we look at European products that are now at the level of Euro 6, the equivalent of Bharat stage 6, we find that there's a tremendous amount of technology going in there. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if five years from now, if we find our atmosphere so polluted, and if you wanted a breath of fresh air, you'd suck on the tailpipe of a modern truck. Um, this company we started... Uh, company called Albanair uh, to engage in state-of-the-art technologies for exhaust emission systems. Again, we said this is not Jugard. We decided that this is a technology-oriented company and we based the company in Germany, right in the technical heartland of Germany. It's run by a complete German team and they've come up with a set of innovations that have significantly reduced the cost and yet improved the efficiency of complex exhaust emission systems. To give you an example, this system that you see, the one on the right, typically these systems, when they're added to modern trucks, would add about 4,000 euros to the cost of a full-blown truck. This system, in other words, alone costs about one and a half nanos. And um, the system that was developed by our group, because of technological innovations, because of uh, uniquely patented approaches to uh, the, the physics of, in this case, uh, NOx emissions, results in a much, much smaller weight and a much, much lower cost compared to competitor designs. And Right now, we're very happy to say that uh, this company has already been locked into a number of long-term contracts for Euro 6 applications, and uh, literally their order book is over 700 million euros. We've also invested in what we believe are uh, efficiency enablers arising out of IT. This, again, to me is a, a pet theme because of what we can do so much in India. So much so that... Uh, no matter what we t think about of vehicle configuration management, uh, manufacturing system and supply chain management, fleet management and fleet operation management, all of that to be able to manage this with um, highly IT-enabled solutions and therefore achieve total cost of operation to be far better than we could have ever done without these technologies and tools earlier. One of the last uh, slides I'll leave you with is uh, one of our last products. This was our attempt to make a completely new, low-cost light truck in the LCV business. Ashok Leyland had never had an LCV business uh, before. We always made big and heavy trucks. So when we decided to get into the light truck business, we felt, again, that we had to completely change the operating economics of this uh, system. So we together in our joint venture with Nissan, we put together a brand new product. Uh, I'm very happy to say that in its first year, it's won LCV of the year, and it's on, on to a, it's gone on to a fairly good uh, uh, booking record for the first year. But what again is to me more impressive is that 
this was a program that in three years flat was executed by a team of Indian engineers. Notwithstanding the fact that we had a joint venture with Nissan, the entire activities were executed out of India, run out of an Indian team that was newly created just about three and a half years ago. There was no team before that. So to bring a team together, get the whole program kick-started, and to get the product done was itself a huge, huge task. But what is more impressive is the fact that the way this team has uh, created credibility within the, the world of Nissan. And I'll leave you with a few comments from probably the most uh, recognized auto leader in the world today, Mr. Carlos Ghosn, chairman of uh, the Renault-Nissan Alliance. We don't go to India to bring something. We go to India also to learn something. That's very important. It's a two-way street. And not only to learn through using their suppliers and using the people, the Indian people, but learn about processes, a mindset, mm -hmm. way of thinking, not only for India, but for the emerging markets. And just if I can tell you one story, which, which today actually is a great uh, business uh, product success in India. Uh, you know, we were going to the Indian market. Obviously, none of our cars could be sold there because they were too expensive even if we were doing them locally we want to bring a product in the pickup truck which is a, a, a large segment in the Indian market but we don't know how to do it I mean our, the, our least expensive pickup truck is probably uh, cost five times what the Indian market can <coughs> afford this product was developed by an Indian team with our collaboration it's called the dust it is the number one seller pickup truck in India and it came at a unbelievable cost that, you know, the Nissan people who were at the base of the drawing, at the base of the concept, could not believe. Now the dust is such a success in India mm -hmm. that uh, the salespeople in the Middle East yeah. who heard about the dust, say, I said, we want it. Uh, the people in Indonesia say, how can we import mm -hmm. it? So now the product is going to become a world car. It's going to become a world car for us. To me, this is the inspiration, that the talent and the capabilities we have in India, particularly uh, bolstered by our intrinsic ability to be frugal and to be efficient with resources, these are skills that are going to be in demand all over the world. And I would like to therefore bring to closure this talk by saying all of you who are involved in program management in one form or the other, and all of you who are going to contribute and shape Indian industry for the future, I truly believe that this next generation um, will establish India's credentials globally as a program management hub. So Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. More minister? We will have uh, five minutes of Q&A. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, hey. uh, I'm Chayan Koshra. I've just come from Delhi. I, uh, actually, five and a half years ago, uh, during my college years, actually, uh, we designed a, a car, a go-kart, for Formula Zero racing. I hope you uh, know about it. It's uh, basically on fuel cell engines. And uh, we use hydrogen uh, gas, and output was CO2 and water. So uh, do you see any lead way for the future in the fuel cell engines in the Indian industry or abroad? Well, uh, the whole hydrogen economy ran into a problem. I mean, as you know, President Bush, during his time, really bet a lot on the hydrogen economy. But what the whole world has learned is that uh, the whole economics of hydrogen production, storage, distribution, and processing is very expensive. Hydrogen is not a fuel.
hydrogen is an energy carrier just like electricity. So you have to produce hydrogen somewhere. And most conventional forms of producing hydrogen are very expensive. Uh, in some forms, they actually do go back to fossil fuels. So while it was a promising idea, uh, the whole hydrogen economy has run into the technical difficulties of how one is going to, on an industrial scale, make, store, distribute, and use hydrogen. So I think the whole world's taken a bit of a pause on hydrogen. Um, thank you, sir. Next question. Good morning. Mm -hmm. All right. Morning. Uh, my question is uh, more from the social responsibility perspective, sort of. Uh, we are all aware that we still travel in one big car every day to office and then come back, create a lot of traffic and other stuff. And we are desperately in need of one very good vehicle where one single person or two people can travel more effectively. So how soon? You know, can we expect in the market uh, a kind of uh, very advanced technology, technological car that everyone can make use of, and then we decrease the amount of traffic and burn the fuel, all sort of things? I think uh, you've raised a very important question. Um, mobility in urban context, particularly for a country like India, high population density country, is a very complex subject. And I think what people are moving towards is to reconcile some very fundamental human principles. And by which I, I, I would take the question into a higher plane. The first is uh, human beings intrinsically need choice. Uh, nobody will accept to be told, you shall do only this. So human beings intrinsically want choice. And therefore, we want a choice in the, uh, in the modes of mobility we want to use. Some people may be happy to take a bus, some people may be happy to take a train, some people may want a private car or whatever. But the second question, that ha the second corollary that has to go with it is that if you were to ch exercise your choice, then you have to pay for the cost of your choice in whatever the society would deem to be fair, choice, fair cost. And by this, again, I'm making a much larger definition of cost. Cost is not the cost of petrol and the cost of insurance. The cost is the societal cost we create or we uh, consume when we use a particular choice. So for instance, if I today assume that I have a free parking spot outside the road, maybe that is not free really, that there is a cost to the provision of a parking spot. Now, if you take these two concepts together, what you will find in advanced societies is that you will start to go to multimodal transport solutions. I travel a lot to Japan. And frankly, Tokyo, one cannot uh, move around assuming that you're always going to do it in a personal car. And so today you have mobility in Tokyo provided by a combination of high-speed trains, underground, subways, light trains, buses. Um, so you have a wide range of transport solutions. And within that, you're going to have to choose what you want. And if you're going to choose something that is more personal, you will have to ultimately reconcile to paying more for that choice. I think, in a way, this is how I see modern societies evolve, continuing to provide choice, but making sure that when you choose and exercise your choice, that you will pay society appropriately for that choice. Thank you, sir. One last sir. question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned about frugal engineering. So my question is, uh, uh, does frugal engineering compromise on quality? And if not, does your estimation in the first place was wrong? No, I think uh, it goes back to the definition uh, of the, the concept. Let me give you two examples. If that aircraft that I showed you in the first slide, if somebody said that quality of that aircraft meant that it must last 50 years, then obviously that pro aircraft was not the right quality. There is no quality without a context. Quality exists in a context. And therefore, uh, like all program managers or like all designers, you design to a specification. You design to a set of requirements. And as long as those requirements are stated, then doing more than what you're required to do is waste. 
again to give you an example the Tata Nano has drum brakes all around most modern cars have disc brakes in the front drum brakes in the rear so somebody would say oh it's, you've taken a shortcut in quality why are you providing drum brakes in the front and rear but the objective of the Nano is to be a city car and in a city car you're never going to be going over 80 kilometers per hour and the whole car weighs only 620 kilograms so I don't need the heat dissipation of a disc brake to provide the retardation that I want so a disc brake is a frivolous extra in a nano whereas a BMW engineer would say ah you've sacrificed on quality I'm not satisfying the requirement of the BMW engineer I'm satisfying the requirement of this customer so Thank you very so, much. Sir. Thank you very much, and I truly believe you'll make the guests next generation for India. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.